Uh, news Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to this session, China's evolving business context. It seems that uh, the guests on the stage are quite uh, influential. Uh, I very often went to the winter <laughs> session at the World Economic Forum, and from time to time, we saw the number of guests on the stage outnumbered the audience. But today, we see such a big audience. So this session is focused on China's evolving business context, a quite big title subject. But unfortunately, we have only one hour, so we have to focus our discussions on Chinese businesses and the re-engineering of micro-governance structure of Chinese companies. Yesterday, there was an, a closed-door session at which Premier Li Keqiang delivered a speech. During his speech, he said, more than 10 years ago, there were only less than scores of Chinese companies ranked among the top 500 companies in the world. But today, there are more than 100 Chinese companies in the name list of the top 500. So obviously, Chinese companies have been developing quite successfully. And for those top 500 Chinese companies, most of them are state-owned enterprises. So this is the first message Premier Li Keqiang delivered to the audience. Second message of him is what should be the next step that China shall take to reform, particularly in terms of economic reforms. Premier Li Keqiang said the most important focal point will be how to have a proper limit on the power of the state, of the government, and to give a bigger play to the market. SOEs play a very big part in the Chinese economy. For instance, uh, Chairman Fu Cheng Yu, who represents Sinopec, his company is a typical uh, example. And also Madame Dong, her company, Geli, is also a, a state-owned uh, enterprise. So the first question will be why China must have reform on state-owned enterprises. And after that, we will have uh, uh, free discussions. Uh, I was told to brief the audience of uh, the uh, meeting approach. Uh, I think this session is televised. And uh, if you're interested in these topics, you are welcome to raise your questions on the internet and I will uh, convey your questions to the four VIPs on the stage. So we have uh, wireless uh, terminals available for you to raise questions. But first and foremost, I will give the floor to the three gentlemen and one lady on the stage. They, all of them, represent a very famous companies. Uh, Madam Dong, Chairman, uh, Chairperson Dong, <laughs> Chairperson Dong Mingzhu is chairperson of uh, Gree Electric Appliances, uh, well-established and very respected brand in China. And the company's uh, history can be dated back to the 1980s. Second, uh, Madam Fu Cheng Yu, chairman of uh, China Petro Petroleum and Chemical Corporation, and uh, his company is, of course, definitely one of the top 500. And the third VIP is Mr. Klaus Klinfeld, Chairman and CEO of Alcoa. Look at uh, Mr. Uh, Klein Feld, He's a, he, he represents a very strong American business. Uh, uh, he, he has been trying to promote his company, his company's products in the meeting room. And the fourth gentleman is uh, 
uh, Mr. Mohammad uh, Al Mahdi from SAPEC, also a very big and influential uh, investment company. Okay, I think, lady first, I will first invite uh, Madam Dong to say a few words about why China must reform its SOEs. In the international community, people always see SOEs as a part of the government. So when they look at SOEs, they look at them with a quite a subtle and special perspective. This is quite unique. Secondly, SOE is something formed with very special historical reasons. But as China is opening itself wider to the rest of the world, it is, of course, necessary and natural for China to reform its SOEs, to make the SO Chinese SOEs more adapted to international business community, to allow them to manage themselves from a more internationalized perspective. I think this is the most important reason. Okay, Mr. Fu, what's your thought? Why? Why do we have to restructure uh, Chinese SOEs? Any serious problems with SOEs? Well, when we are talking about this round of Chinese economic reform, we need to think about what happened back in the early 1980s when China started the uh, market-oriented reform. At that time, the entire economy was 100 percent. I mean, the companies in China are, uh, were 100 percent state-owned enterprises. There were none private companies in China. So at that time, people believed the advantage of China to compete is to restructure its economic institutions. At that time, China started to practice a mixed ownership of companies uh, with uh, the state ownership as the dominant structure and uh, coupled with the cultivation of uh, private companies. And uh, in the past uh, three decades, the SOEs survived the e economic reform and uh, prospered. And also private companies survived and prospered. We see bigger and bigger community of uh, private companies and private entrepreneurs. And they are the new opportunities the new vitality of the Chinese economy, and they represent the competitiveness of China in a new era. In late 1990s, and also at the turn of the centuries, Chinese SOEs experienced a very painful process of restructuring. And in about three years' time, Many SOEs almost died, but fortunately, after a very painful process of market-oriented restructuring, they survived, flourished, prospered, and competed in the market. And now they are much stronger than before. And even in the international business community, these Chinese large SOEs function and perform very well. So this represents the power, the economic power of China compared with the former Soviet Union. The biggest difference of China is as follows. In 1980s, when the Soviet Union practiced economic reform, the practice of Soviet Union was similar to what China did, namely market-oriented reform. However, in China, we had a mixed ownership with the state ownership as the dominance and the supplementation of uh, private companies. But the Soviet Union didn't do that. The, so the outcome was quite different. Uh, the Russian SOEs lost their competitiveness. But at the same time, we didn't see the formation of a very competitive private companies and private business people in Soviet Union. Now, come back to China. Both Chinese SOEs and private companies are developing themselves. 
SOEs have gone through the period of survival, and the target in front of them is to improve the efficiency of themselves, as well as the efficiency of the Chinese economy as a whole. So both SOEs and private companies in China are very much committed to enhancing their core competence. And in that process, reform is definitely the pivotal tool to make Chinese companies more market-oriented, to reduce the influence of the administration on the market, on the business community. And in that process, the key lies in governance restructure, uh, corporate governance, the improvement of uh, the quality of assets and of uh, Chinese companies. So the purpose of uh, the SOE reform is not to get rid of them from the market. Rather, on the contrary, we want to build them bigger and healthier. And this is very clearly written in the document of the third plenum of the 18th CPC Central Committee. The purpose of Chinese economies uh, that the purpose of the reform of the Chinese economy is to improve the governance structure and institutions of Chinese companies and make them modernized. And that's the fundamental goal. And every discussion about SOE reform must be based on that fundamental guideline in the document. So number one, we need to maintain the status of state ownership as the dominant power in the Chinese economy. SOEs must be more competitive, more vital, more dynamic. And the key is to reduce administrative influence on them. Thank you very much, uh, Chair P Chairman Fu and uh, Madam Dong. Mr. Fu said that uh, uh, market orientation and uh, de administratization shall be the key of SOE reform. But I, what I want to ask you is how can we realize the goals of making SOEs more market oriented, make SOEs less influenced by? the government by the state. It might be a little bit sensitive or difficult to you. Madam Duan, uh, you, uh, when Premier Li Keqiang organized uh, a business forum to solicit opinions from business people, you said on that occasion uh, something very interesting. Mr. Li, uh, Premier Li asked what the business community wants to have from the government, any support? And your answer is that we don't need any support from the government. You just uh, leave us alone. And that's the biggest support for us. Uh, OK, uh, Mr. Fu talked about the, the unique features of SOEs. My company is, to some extent, a state-owned company. But we run the company as a, 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 a free, uh, oh, sorry, a private, market-oriented company. The other three, uh, the three gentlemen represent three top 500 uh, companies. But my company is not yet ranked as a top 500. But we are working on that. We are close to the threshold, but not yet in the club yet. C air condition uh, is uh, quite. Uh, f uh, highly competitive market. Mr. Fu, his industry is quite a, a monopolistic uh, industry. My industry is quite different. Uh, so for industry like air conditioner, what we really need is a f an environment for free co competition instead of the support from the government. What I want to see is that what we really need is to gain the market by using our state-of-art state technology. 
if we really rely on the government support and the administrative support from the government, I don't think our enterprise can be developed in a sustainability way. So we really need to think about the long term and the sustainability of a corporation. If you look at the Fortune 500, we can see many of the previous Fortune 500 has existed from the club. I, so I don't think that becoming a Fortune 500 is such prime importance to us. I think what I really want to focus is that whether we can establish a long-term sustainable corporation, that's really what I want to focus. If we want to talk about uh, the reform and the reshuffling of the SOEs, the focus is that we need to set up a uh, eternity of uh, enterprise, which is we can have a long-lived enterprise. Now we would like to move to the international perspective. Now, Mr. Klaus from Alco, Alcoa. Uh, in your uh, uh, view, I mean, uh, how you have been dealing with the uh, state-owned enterprise uh, all along. So how do you view uh, uh, China's uh, state-owned enterprises from your, your own point of view? Well, look, I would come from a different perspective. And I would come from a perspective of China has roughly 1.3 billion people, right? A lot of those people are very intelligent, and China is known for being very entrepreneurial, right? When you now move to the West Coast in the US and look who is engaged there in the Silicon Valley, you f see a lot of Chinese, you know, and they are very entrepreneurial. They are involved in building new companies. And it's just a simple fact of life that you have to let the market forces flow and give people of any age and certainly young people the opportunity if they have an idea to find the money, to find the support and to build those, right? So I think that uh, the question is rather, I mean, how do we have to reform the state-owned enterprises? Rather, I mean, we have to give that segment of the society better access so that they, that they have the same type of chances than the state-owned enterprises, right? And we know that the financial system has not been as such and that it, it actually was, was and is still very difficult and very expensive, you know, if you want to build your own company. So I would start with this. And I would, well, yesterday we had the private session as the chairman who said, I mean, with uh, Premier Li, and uh, I mean, you see the reforms, and uh, the understanding is very, very clear. Uh, there is a desire to have a more balanced economy, to have a more sustainable growth. So in, in reality, we need those type of reforms. He was talking about yesterday about the financial reforms. This is great. Let me tell you an anecdote that shows you that something has happened that I think we need to reverse. I remember I've been coming to China for many, many years, and, I rem and typically once a year, I go to university and to talk to the students. And I remember when I first came, um, it's always nice and full and a great debate, and now they are all speaking even better English, you know, fantastic. And they are typically very intelligent, and I would hire most, most of the time, would love to hire almost everybody. I still remember in the first years, I would say the first 10 years, um, when I asked the question of what do you desire, where do you want to go? And I asked it in categories. I mean, who of you wants to join an international firm? Who of you wants to do a start? up, you know, and who of you wants to know a, a, a state-owned enterprise? It was very clear. The, 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 the desire of, of the best and brightest in the university was, I want to join an international firm because I want to get into education and I want to have an opportunity to understand how the global, uh, global market works. Not so in the last, uh, I would say, 10 years. If you go around to the top university today and ask the question, it's kind of scary because most, most of the young talent says, well, I want to go to a state-owned enterprise. When you, say, when you ask them, why do you want to do that? They say, because that gives me better opportunities to grow inside of China, right? Now, there is something that's wrong with the allocation of, of what I consider the most important resource for any economy, and that's talent, right? So I think we got to put it back together let, it, let, let opportunities grow and also see the opportunities that Western and international firms bring. Because on the question of, I mean, what is wrong with state-owned enterprises, first of all, monopolies are never good. I, I agree with that point, uh, that, that point, because they make you slow, right? I don't, by the way, I think that there are quite a number of state-owned enterprises that are very well run also, very, very well run, and have excellent, excellent talent. They have avoided this, uh, this uh, lethargic, lethargic move. But at the same time, you need to make sure that, uh, that the talent has opportunities to find its own way. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll pass out the question to uh, Mr. Almady. Uh, um, oh, he's uh, is one of the 500, uh, uh, you know, just uh, biggest company in the world. But uh, your company is also stay owned, right? I mean, uh, so how do you operate a, a stay owned company in uh, in Saudi? Well, let me let me share uh, some of our uh, beginning. Uh, we started with almost uh, two billion dollars. Mm. That was the beginning. The government gave us two billion dollars and say, you know, you have to start uh, petrochemical. The business. initial capitalization. The initial two capital. So how many years ago? Now that was in 1977. Today, this company is uh, 130 billion dollars, and mm. it's listed as number 120. Uh, from the five, Fortune 500. Mm. So this didn't come really by chance. It came by uh, really good strategy by the government. Uh, it's a hands-off strategy. And uh, it put the company on the, on the road, and then it's up to the company to continue. But uh, we have not been tested, you know, if, if we had made a mistake or something whether the government is going to interfere or not. We have been successful all the way. So hopefully this uh, strategy uh, will continue. We have uh, uh, a board uh, from government, and then later the government divested 30% uh, from SABIC uh, to the private sector. We gained some experience from the private sector. Uh, we gained uh, through our acquisitions. We acquired... Uh, Few companies around the world, the likes of GE Plastic and Dutch State Mine DSM and Huntsman. And we gained experience from those companies, from global companies, in the comp especially in the compliance area, which is very critical to us. We gain experience from the media like you, because you, you keep the transparency uh, of these companies uh, under scrutiny. So media, compliance, and government's hands-off policy really resulted in, in a good company. We have joint ventures here in, in, in China with the, my friend here, Mr. Fu, in, in the petrochemical area, and we have uh, gauged the, the competence uh, of state-owned companies in Sinopec, and we don't find really much difference. As a matter of fact, we really appreciate the, what they do in the safety and the environment and other things, which uh, for our two companies was really a win-win. So. The most important thing is really have a long-term strategy and execute on that long-term strategy. Uh, compliance is, is of the essence, and also I think some participation of the private is, is important, but the muscles of the state must be there really to drive forward and, and bring the strategy to completion. Mm. Okay, yeah. Uh, so why do we need to reorganize or restructure the SOE? The four speakers have shared with us their insights and their perspectives. How can we just reform the SOEs? What kind of methodologies can we use to really implement it? The third plenary of the 18th CPC session has raised out the mixed ownership structure concept, the so-called mixed structure concept, is it really a very good methodology to have the reform of the SOEs? Our friend from the Arabian world has told us they are also SOE. They are also developed from the 1977, uh, the fund of 2 billion to current days of 130 billion. So if we can solve the ownership structure, can we solve all everything? So I'm going to raise several questions since we are going to get some questions from the internet and then we are going to open the floor for Q&A session. If you have any questions or any comments, please just raise it. Uh, Madam Dong, the mixed ownership structure, do you think that is the good solution for the SOE problems? I think the main issue is still about such a mixed ownership reform can be regarded as a kind of medicine. If we take a good medication and then the disease will be well treated, 
However, we are worried about any kind of other complications it may bring about when we had the medicine. The most important thing is that we need to follow the market rules. The corporations will operate in a market-oriented environment without the interference of the government. If the government is still thinking about things, I'm the biggest shareholder, or at least I'm one of the shareholder, and still holding the old rooted concept of the administrative interference, I don't think the mixed ownership structure can be a good solution. I have been thinking about it for quite a long period of time since I've been serving as the delegate successively for three times. And I have been raising the idea that no matter you are a mixed structure or a listed company or SOE, every company should have a uniform and standardized modern governance structure, which will also create a level playing field for all the enterprises, no matter what kind of ownership are you. And during the development process of your corporation, no matter your SOE or private sector, I believe the decision makers, which means the senior executive's decision, are extremely important. What kind of road are you going to take your corporation to? 20 years ago, for the very first 10 years, we haven't fully aware of our corporate social responsibility. That is to say, for the first 10 years, we are thinking about how to make a profit or how to survive. That is our objective of our corporation. However, during the process of our involvement, the CSR seems to be more important than making a profit. The environmental damage that has been brought about by the operation of our corporation or not being able to able to operate in an honest way, all these things are not the things that we want from a modern corporation with CSR. So more and more, we have realized we need to have better operational ideas and use optimal technologies to ensure that we can have a good corporation. It is not really about whether we can realize a mixed structure which will just ensure our success. So you are talking about from the shareholders or stake structures perspective, if these types of ownership structure wouldn't be able to create a miracle without a modern governance. For example, in the board of uh, directors, there should be a platform for open exchanges and etc. If you are only taking some fund from the private sector, it won't solve everything, right? Yes, indeed, grain electronic appliances at the very beginning, it is a wholly owned SOE, owned by a provincial government. At the very beginning, they have an investment of 30 million. Currently, we have given them great return, which is more than 300 times than the investment at the very beginning. Uh, so they are getting our return with and they are trying to receive our generosity. However, if there is anything, they will just interfere from the administrative perspective, even though they have been gaining great returns from us. So we need to battle with them. As I said, our industry is a fully competitive market. Without a market-oriented business approach, we would have already died in the market. So let me rephrase what you said. Uh, the government comes to you when there is good things, but when p bad things happen, they just run away. Yes, that's true. This is what, what we have experienced in the past. This is the truth. They, the government is, uh, uh, sometimes we want. Uh, uh, sometimes the government comes to us that uh, see Gray as a company just to uh, lend some money to this subsidiary of a Chinese uh, of a government uh, controlled company because that company needs uh, equity injection. But we always said no, no way because we was a Gray is a public listed company. We can't do that. Okay, Mr. Fu, mixed uh, ownership. Do you think it's the? Is that the uh, solution? 
I think our discussion, as I said, uh, should be based on the document of the third plenum of the 18th CPC Central Committee. Mixed ownership is not uh, everything about SOE reform, and it is even not the main part of the SOE reform. It is only one part or one of the many targets, objectives of China's SOE reforms in the past. Actually, mixed ownership is not something new. Ever since 1984, mixed ownership has always been the buzzword of the Chinese economy. We've been walking along this road for more for uh, for for 30 years already. So today, when we talk about mixed ownership, our attention is focused on the ultimate goal of uh, the reforming of Chinese economic institutions. It is merely a tool. So as I said, when we talk about SOE reform, this topic actually involves many diversified uh, thoughts, uh, um, modalities, and so on. The, in my view, the fundamental solution is what I said earlier, how to make SOEs more market-oriented, how to reduce the administ administrative uh, interference in Chinese uh, companies. So GRI is a local government-controlled company, but uh, my company, Sinopec, is a central government-controlled company. W to be honest, I think uh, Sinopec is, uh, has a bigger degree of uh, freedom. Uh, do, do you necessarily mean that the central government has less influence or interference in you compared to Madame Dong's company? Yes, that's true. Uh, in There is none, no people designated by any uh, central government ministry to sit in our boardroom. You see, uh, this industry is somewhat uh, a monopoly industry in China, but when we compete, we have to compete in the international market. For instance, for SABIC, we work, we, we, we cooperate with them, but in some cases, we also compete with them. So for companies like Sinopec, our eye is on the international market. We compete in the international market instead of domestic market. Uh, we. Uh, have uh, invested uh, 90 billion yuan. And this 90 billion yuan is not completely from the Chinese government or from Chinese banks. Actually, we borrow from the international capital market from foreign banks because the borrowing cost is lower in the international capital market compared to domestic market. So, and there is no government approval process when we make uh, investment decisions in the international market, but only one exception, exchange, foreign exchange. Uh, when we uh, make outward investment, we must get the approval from the state administration of foreign exchange. So as uh, Premier Li Keqiang said, the government also needs to change its mind. And uh, as far as this point is concerned, first and foremost is the approval system and also the rule of law uh, mentality. So Mr. Li Keqiang said yesterday, uh, the Chinese government must delegate its power to the lower level government or even to the business community, uh, bigger freedom should be given to Chinese companies to make their independent business decisions. Of course, some other topics shall be considered, such as safety or environmental protection. But as far as the profitability, as far as the bottom line of the company is concerned, this is the business of the company. It's not the business of the government. In China, within China, apart from tax, uh, we have to pay many kinds of fees. So fees are a very special phenomena here in China. Apart from tax, you also need to pay a kind, all kinds of fees to the government. Last year, we paid over 300 billion yuan of taxes and fees to the government. 
every day. I pay 800 million yuan every day to the Chinese government, covering all kinds of taxes and fees. This is unimaginable for my international peers. Because Sinopec is a state-owned company, we have to fulfill our corporate social responsibility. So the biggest thing we pay to the government is not tax. Actually, it is fees. This is very unique in China. But with that said, of course, Sinopec has to improve its uh, competitiveness to make it more, uh, make it stronger in the international market. So. We we are focused on the international market. We need to be more open, more transparent, more standard as far as corporate governance is concerned. Only when we can do that can we develop into a stronger business, can we have a bigger uh, capability to undertake our corporate social responsibility. For instance, uh, climate change, big companies play a big role uh, in this process. Uh, we commit to the government that in a three-year period, we need uh, to spend about uh, 28, uh, 22.8 billion yuan to improve our uh, environmental uh, responsibility. At the same time, we cannot uh, cut our workforce significantly. This is also why the profit per employee of Sinopec is lower than our international peer. So cut the, um, cutting the headcount is not the possible way for us to improve our profitability. So our only way out is to uh, run more efficiently. So Sinopec is a huge company. We have a big responsibility. We also have big burden for the society, for the government. But still, we manage to grow at a very remarkable, remarkably faster pace year by year. So as I said, uh, cutting employees is not the possible way. Uh, compared to some of my international peers, the number of Sinopec's employees is about 10 times of them. So Chinese companies have to find their own ways. We shall learn from the West, but that's not enough. We learn the Western concepts, the Western skills, the Western expertise. But when it comes to the management, the day-to-day -day management on the field, we must take into consideration the Chinese, unique Chinese characteristics. So Chinese. SOEs and Chinese private companies, it's the same. Uh, thank you. Now I'd like to give the floor to our to the two gentlemen from uh, outside China. Maybe for for them, the mixed uh, ownership might be a little bit difficult uh, concept for them. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, it seems that there are many questions raised on the website, uh, the internet. Uh, recently, the uh, Chinese government decided to to set a ceiling on the annual salary of C-level executives of Chinese state-owned enterprises. And this involves many uh, industries, banking, and many other industries. And the ceiling is 600,000 or seven, uh, six, 600,000 to 700,000. This is the ceiling for their annual salary. So my colleagues from America and Saudi Arabia, uh, Many of these Chinese uh, state-owned companies are already top 500 companies. They compete not only within China, but also outside China. When such a ceiling, salary ceiling is set on them, namely around uh, 100,000 US dollars, 
every year. Do you think it's a good way for them to to stimulate or incentivize them uh, in their day-to-day -day work? Well, what's your what's your comment, Mr. Klaus? Uh, Klaus, perhaps you can. Yeah, I mean, uh, Mr. Fu, uh, I'm sure uh, 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 as a salary reduction, he, he's uh, leading a, a one of the largest oil company in the world. He cannot make uh, over, uh, his salary probably cannot ma uh, be over 100,000 US dollars. I mean, well, so what, what's your take on this issue? Well, like with the previous discussion on, on co-ownership, I mean, I think the real question is, uh, what do you want to solve? What's the problem that you want to solve, right? So if you, if you uh, reduce the incentives of, of talent going into a certain industry by cutting the salaries, is that what you want to solve? I personally believe that uh, talent is the foundation for everything, right? So you want to attract the best and brightest to go into the places where you need them most, right? So that's one way to look at it. I mean, and, and on the other point, I mean, if, if you have somebody co-investing with you, I mean, again, what do you want to solve with this? I mean, I personally think that um, if we want to have a broader sustainable growth in the, in the society, um, I think we have to focus on getting a level playing field first, right? And a level playing field requires a financial reform. So if somebody has an idea and wants to, wants to start their own company, they have to have access to, to money and to funds in the same way that state-owned enterprises have to have it, because otherwise this is not going to fly. On the discussion on governance, you know, again, I can see what you solve with better governance. I mean, if you say, I want to have a more global perspective in the board, obviously that's a great thing. I personally love the board that we have and the discussion that we have, and every time that we are together, I learn a lot. And uh, there, th but again, it's a different perspective. I mean, there it could be, could make a lot of sense for Chinese companies that say, we want to globalize, so we want the global discussion or also to happen more strongly inside of the firm, and we start with the board. So we bring on board, I mean, a number of respected international voices so that you can have them reflected, you know? If you want to solve the, the, the whole aspect, you touched upon it on, and you too, on environmental aspects. I mean, unfortunately, not every company here in China, as we know also from recent events, um, is very safe, you know? And not every company here in China really is very environmentally friendly. Otherwise, we would not have these gigantic issues that we are currently struggling with here, here in countries. So there, the issue is you, you, you establish not only standards, we have established standards, but you enforce the standards. Right? So, again, I mean, depending on what you want to solve, the answer is different. Uh, on the bureaucracy side, there's thousands of ideas how you can solve with bureaucracy. One aspect you mentioned, I mean, if you live in a province and the provincial leader who is basically also giving you the finance, you know, or, or, or gives you tax reliefs, you know, uh, tells you you can't fire any people, well, that's a sheer recipe for bureaucracy, right? And certainly there's no way, if you have those type of restrictions, that you ever are going to be competitive on a global scale. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, well, what, what, what they're trying to solve, there is this, our central government, the, the party, they feel that uh, those uh, uh, stay-owned enterprise uh, chief, uh, chairmen and uh, CEOs, and they're, they're making too much over the society uh, tolerance level. I mean, that's uh, what they're trying to solve. I mean, uh, they feel that they, they, they're making too much. I mean, well, the simple rule of life is, I mean, uh, like with taxes, you know, uh, I mean, people go where they feel their benefits are higher. You know, so in the end, I mean, the consequences, people will go somewhere else. That might be a good thing at this mm. point in time, you know. And in general, I mean, these, these discussions on, on who should make what are very difficult uh, societal discussions, I mean, that have m really multiple facets. And I've always seen that uh, they only come up in reality uh, because very often they are a substitute for different discussions, a substitute for discussions of what societal standards do we have. I mean, what, uh, how, how, how clean is our society? How do people get treated? How much social responsibility is shown in a, in a region? Usually, this is the real discussion, and the rest then becomes the proxy. Oh, okay. So you're, you're not going to talk about conspiracy <laughs> theory? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you okay. know it better. <laughs> so to uh, Amadi, I mean, uh, I'm not going to ask uh, what you make. I mean, uh, <laughs> but uh, could you imagine like a Mr. Fu here? I mean, uh, they cannot make uh, 
well, is that 100,000 US dollars a, a year? I mean, is that uh, to you? I mean, is uh, too much to make or uh, too little? I mean, could you make it? <laughs> well, uh, l let me go back a little bit to the mixed ownership uh, question, just if you, uh, divert a little bit and then come back to, to the compensation issue. Uh, the mixed ownership is okay if it, in, if it has representation on the board. Without representation is meaningless as far as I'm concerned. So having members from the private on the state on right, they will defend. They, they will defend uh, the company. And if there is interference from government, we always go and get the help from our uh, uh, independent uh, people on the board. And, and the other way around, I mean, if there is much pressure here, we can go to the government. So you can, you know, get a balance uh, of uh, governance there. So uh, if you fix the, the salary of the, uh, the, there is no incentive for uh, entrepreneurial uh, ship in, into the company. The best way is really pay for performance. If the company doesn't perform, it doesn't get much. If the company do a fantastic performance on a global basis, he should be paid. He should be rewarded. Not only him, but all of the executive management and all of the employees. So really we have a, a performance culture in the company that drives efficiency, as Mr. Fu said. You cannot drive efficiency without performance. And performance require you have to pay. Okay, yeah. Now this question is related to our two 然后我 would like to come back to the two Chinese speakers.、Uh, Madam Zhong, this competition scheme clearly involves you because it is closely relevant to you.、Uh, actually, since we are a listed public company for so many years, we have been govern our corporation. According to the rules of the public listed company, so this question doesn't have so much relevance with me. So I do not, you do not have a ceiling of your salary, right?、Um, actually, it is not a new rule after the reform of the mixed ownership structure. It is basically targeted on the central SOEs. Probably it has more relevance with Mr. Fu. Why would we just give the floor to Mr. Fu to share with us your opinion, your idea? Probably, it is more pro appropriate for me to address this issue because I'm one of、uh, the stakeholders, real stakeholders. Actually, personally, uh, from a、uh, country's perspective, we are going to reach different conclusions, and from the international trend, you can also reach different.、Uh, Conclusions and results from a personal perspective,、uh, the reduction of a compensation wouldn't be extremely happy for a person. However, if you leave a person aside and if you stand under the level of a country, you will believe it is something we should do. Why do I say so? Because our country is.、Uh, Different from the Western nations, in a sense that we want to pursue a collective richness. So this is the national and the Communist Party policy of pursuant of the collective wealth of everybody, and we have been paying great attention to the idea that our mass public and our workers' staff are the real masters of our nation. This is a national strategy, and also another thing is that we have a widening gap of the income distribution. How can we? Have a harmonious development of our society, and to benefit、uh, the majority of the society instead of、uh, only benefit the minority of a society. For example, the person like me, who is the minority of a society. I think, from our country's perspective, we should bring benefit and welfare to the mass public and the majority of the population. However, our reality is that we have been witnessing the widening gap of the income distribution. Our central SOE, especially in the manufacturing industry, is much better than. 
our other industries. However, our salary is still much higher than that of the ordinary staff of our workers. The more they pay me, the better I the better it is. However, how the next question I'm going to ask is that how can we incentivize our staff if I'm getting an extremely higher salary compared with my staff? I'm not trying to sing high praise of myself or anything. Uh, I want to share with you some of the examples. Of the early 1980s, I began to engage the international exchanges. As the chief representative of the Chinese side, we are working with the foreign joint venture side, including my secretary. They are given the salaries from the foreign shareholder side, they are getting a salary of more than 1,000 Hong Kong dollars, and I'm getting 300 RMB. And my secretary, who is given a salary from the foreign side, is getting a much higher salary. So I'm used to that. I'm also trying to share with you an example of uh, the working experience of working for Sinuk, which is the offshore oil company. That is to say, our company is a red cheap public listed company because we are listed in Hong Kong. That is why we are called red cheaps. So at that time, foreign investors said that uh, you are getting such a low salary, and I'm really worried that you wouldn't really devote to your work. So according to the international practice and the tendency, we have designed the so-called the Hong Kong compensation scheme, including the options that we can get as a senior executive. So at that time, our compensation scheme in Hong Kong in the year of 2001 should be around 3 million to 4 million. And later, this increased to more than 8 million. The options added that we will have an annual salary of more than 10 million Hong Kong dollars. It is approved by the board of directors, and it is also approved by the MOF, the Ministry of Finance. So it is totally legal and legitimate, legitimate for us to get such a high salary. But at that time, I'm talking with my senior executive that we cannot get such a high salary. The reason that we cannot get the compensation is because if you take such high salary, you wouldn't be recognized by our workers to be the leader of this team. Because our Chinese history is different from the Western world. Their his history in the Western world are accumulated by the process of privatization. However, our ownership is totally government uh, monitored such a structure. So if you want to give us such a high salary, then we will just uh, donate it. And we are still getting the salary from the Chinese uh, SOE. But it doesn't have any influence to the performance of our company. At that time, our market cap is above six billion. When I leave, it has reached more than 100 billion Hong Kong US dollars. All the investors said that I'm a happy investor. So because the reason that they are happy investors is because they have been making huge profits. So when I come to Sinopec, I have attracted the investors from the Sinoc to Sinopec. They begin to buy the shares of uh, Sinopec. So it doesn't really rely on whether how much I can make. It really rely on the performance and the efficiency of a company. So we cannot leave the Chinese contest to make a comparison with the salary with our foreign counterpart. After 2008, the financial crisis, the whole world is criticizing the extreme high salaries of the senior executive. And so the Chinese have been following that. That concept, even before 2008, if you want to get a high salary, then you don't need to work for SOE since you are so capable. You can work for other private companies where you can earn a high salary. However, our value is not shown there because I can gain respect by my peers because I can lead a Chinese SOE 
to be competitive in the whole world. That is much more important than the personal salary and the personal income. So, Mr. Fu, you mean that for the Chinese SOEs, you will have to depend on your man morality, right? You will have to be very ethical. You need to stand together with the country. Actually, you should have a proportional kind of distribution of income with your staff. If in the Western world, if this proportion should be dozens of or hundreds of times, if it is a corporation based on private ownership, that is reasonable. However, it is if it is a public ownership as in China, then you wouldn't be able to work in China. When I leave Sinuk, my options measured by Hong Kong US dollars, uh, Hong Kong dollars, it is reaches more than 400 million Hong Kong dollars. I donate all of them. So the Chinese leadership do not pay great attention to the income. When they announce uh, the new policy of the reduction of the compensation for the senior executives, we are not complaining at all. Because of the time limit? I would only allow one quick question. I would like to see whether there are any questions from the audience. Please. Uh, would you please be more specific? Because we are we don't have the time to cover a very big topic. I'm coming from Tsinghua Technology Park. We have uh, already cultivated more than 2,000 corporations in our park. However, very few private companies in China can become a Fortune 500. So I think there should be a mutual and bi-directional investment between the private sector with that of the SOE sector. How can SOE support the private sector corporations development? Because of the time limit, uh, we would only allow one minute for each speaker to answer this question, how SOE support the private enterprise. I think we shouldn't just divide the private and the private public in such a clear and crystal way because grain corporation, our company, it should be said to be a mixed ownership. We should say if we really want to have such kind of divide, to be divided into big or small enterprise, if you have developed yourself into a very big scale, we would pay attention to the development of the SMEs, the small and medium enterprises. The SMEs should try to have your own reflections on how to create the state of art technology, while at the same time, the big enterprises would also give chance to the SMEs. It is not such a simple relationship between public and the private. To be very simple, is the SOEs obliged to support the private enterprises? For each enterprise, we cannot cover all the supply chain. So obviously, the big enterprises will be followed by a chain of SMEs. In our petrochemical industry, we have uh, more than hundreds of uh, enterprises working with us. So. We, in the future, the more we want to say is that when we go global, can we just create such a supply chain conglomerate to go global? Well, we don't have time left for the thing. So, 那大家啊，这今天台上嘉嘉宾对这个国企的问题有一个。so today we have a very good discussion about the SOEs. We would like to ask everybody to have a round of applause to thank all the speakers on board.